up until now, we've always had found derivatives of functions that are pretty straightforward. For example, y equals x squared or y equals cosine of some, some value x. Those are all just pretty straightforward examples. So the derivative would have been 2x. The derivative would have been negative sine x. But what about composite functions? Remember, composite functions were the fog goff method from algebra, where you had one function inside another. What if how can we differentiate equations like this? That's what we that's what we're doing here with the chain rule. What the chain rule says if we have a composite function and we want to find the derivative of it, what we have to do is is in two parts. So if we're going to do d, dx, then we first start off in the outer. We found the derivative of the outer, then times the derivative of the inner. That's the easiest way to explain what's going on here. So if we were looking at y equals sine of 2x. So in this case, the outer function is sine of x, and the inner function is 2x. So for us to take the derivative of this, we'd first take the derivative of sine, which would give us cosine, leave the angle alone, and then times the derivative of the inside, which is two. So the derivative would be two cosine two x. So let's look at example one. y is equal to 3x squared plus 1 squared. Find y prime. So the outer function is squared. So what's the derivative of something squared? Leave the inside alone. So the derivative, bring the power outside, minus one. Now we gotta take the derivative of the inside. So derivative of three x squared would be six x. So our solution would be So this is how we're doing composite functions. We're doing, this is called the chain rule. So we take the derivative of the, in, of the outside first. The outside equation is x squared and the inside. So now another easier way of looking at this is if we can define the inner function as u. So if we if we have a composite function where u is the inner function, mm -hmm. 
what the derivative of this function is going to give us df of x times du dx. So this is what we're, what we're going to be looking for, is we take the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. That's what brings us to theorem two. The chain rule. If f of u is differentiable, what does differentiable mean? You can find the derivative. If you can find the derivative, it means what? That's what you're finding, but what does it mean? What does it mean about the function if it's differentiable? It's continuous. The limit exists at every point within the domain. So again, it just means more than just differentiable. It means a whole bunch of other stuff that comes before it. The stuff we've been talking about for the last uh, five weeks, four weeks. So if f of u is differentiable at any point, u is a function of x. And g of x is also differentiable. At any point x. So for this to work, your composite function has to be composed of two differentiable functions. F of u is differentiable at a point u, which is made up of g of x, and the function g of x is also differentiable at x. If all of this is true, then we get the derivative of the composite function. Remember, the composite function is also written this way. Fog means f of g of x, which means we take the derivative of the outer function, leave the inside alone, times the derivative of the inner function. Since we're looking at a function f of u, where u is at g of x, the derivative dy dx can be made up of dy du times du dx. It means the same stuff. This thing and this mean the same thing. It means exactly the same thing, this whole thing. But remember, the function, the variable of the function is u. So we take the derivative of f with respect to u and then take the derivative of u since u is a function of x. Let's look at the example. Example two. It seems pretty complex, but it's going to help us solve much more complex equations now. Example two. It's a word problem. An object moves along the x-axis so that its point
moves along the x axis. So that its position at any time t greater than zero is given by our position function cosine t squared plus one. Find the velocity of the object as a function of t, of time. How does this relate to what we talked about yesterday? Right, so what do we start off with? Yesterday, what do we start off with? What's the, what was the first thing we found? The position function, S. It was called S yesterday, but now we're calling it X in this example. Why is that important? This is S of X yesterday. So now it is the same thing as x of t, which is cosine t squared plus 1. How do we find the velocity? The velocity is the first derivative of our position function, which is x prime of t. So we'll do it two ways. One way we'll do it straight up the way we just like we always do, and then we'll use the u substitution method. So what's the outer function? What's the outer function? Because remember, we we talk about composite functions, we have to have an outer function and we have to have an inner function. So what's the outer function here? Yeah, it has to be cosine because this is inside the cosine function, right? So we're gonna take the derivative. Of, the derivative of this composite function is equal to the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. So what's the derivative of cosine? Negative sign and leave the inside alone. That's this part. We left the inside alone. Times, what's the derivative of the inside? Two T. Because that's the inside. That's the G. This is the G of X. So G prime of X would be 2T. Therefore, our velocity is negative 2T sine T squared plus one. That's our velocity function with respect to T. Let's do the same equal example here. Using U substitution. 
the U is substituted for the inner function. So which was the inner function? The G of X. Yeah. So U of X is T squared plus one. Or we, we just call it U. So what we have here is cosine U. What's the derivative of u? Two t. So the derivative of our position function, which is the velocity, is equal to the derivative of our function. Remember, it's the derivative of y with respect to u, and then the times the derivative of u with respect to x. So the derivative of cosine u is negative sine u. The same as we did yesterday. Sin, the derivative of sine x is cosine x. Now we take the derivative of u. put everything back in. So we have sine u is equal to t squared plus one times u prime is two t, which is negative two t sine t squared plus one. It helps to know both methods of taking differentiations because if you have a large equation to take a derivative of, it could be a composite function itself. Instead of writing it many, many times, just do it once. Let's see examples. Example three. Differentiate sine x squared plus e to the x with respect to x. So when we say differentiate, we mean take the derivative of it. So we know that y is equal to sine x squared plus e of x. Then u is what? x squared plus e of x. Therefore, du dx would be what? Very good. So what we have in this example, we have sine of u So the derivative is dy with respect to u times du with respect to x. What is dy du? What's the derivative of y with respect to u? Derivative of sine is cosine, cosine u, times the derivative of u with respect to x, which we figured out over here, 2x plus ex. Substitute u back in there. We got cosine x squared plus e of x times 2x plus e of x 
it'd be easier if you put it in front. So there's your derivative. Example four. Differentiate y is equal to e cosine x. This one is going to help us define this rule. When everything derivative of the e function, no matter what the exponent is, it's always going to be eu du. That's the general rule for taking the derivative of an exponential function. So the derivative of y is equal to, well, what's u first? So we have e to the power u. What's du? This is du with respect to x. So what's the derivative, taking derivative of u with respect to x, what's the derivative of cosine x? Negative sine x. So according to this derivative of an e of the exponential function, it is e to the u times du dx. e to the u, u is cosine x, du dx is negative sine x. So it's negative sine x e to the power cosine x. And that, that's always, always, always the, the rule for the E function. The beautiful thing about the chain rule is that you can do it multiple times. I could do derivatives. You could do multi multiple derivatives. You could do the chain rule multiple times. So for example, if g of t equals tangent five minus sine two t, find g prime of t. So how would you do this one? Here are the steps. Find u or define u. So my first step, what is u equal? Five minus sine two t. Second step, find du, d, in this case is dt. So the derivative of five is what? 
if you look at this, now we have to do it again. We have to do the, do the u factor again because it's a function within a function. So in this case, we got u2. u2 is 2t. du2 with respect to t is what? What's the derivative of 2t? 2. So what we have now is this becomes 5 minus sine u. The derivative of 5 is 0. There's the minus sign. The derivative of sine is cosine u times du. We've got negative cosine of 2t times 2, which makes it negative 2 cosine 2t. So what does all this find? This finds du. We have u right here, and we have du there. So if we look at our equation, we have tangent of u. The derivative is tangent of tangent. What's the derivative of tangent? We did those yesterday. What's the derivative? What's that? Secant squared a. Secant squared u times du. So you take the derivative of the outside, which gives us secant squared. Then you take the derivative of the inside. And that gives us secant squared of five minus sine 2t times what we just found, negative 2 cosine 2t. Since that's negative, I'll put that in front. So we have negative 2 cosine 2t times secant squared 5 minus sine 2t. There's your answer. There's g prime. Yeah, definitely the answer looks worse than the question. The power chain rule. So, so far, all of our U's have been pretty straightforward. But what if we had a... Our function u, which is remember, it's it's made up of x, if it's raised to the power n, 
what's the derivative of that? So the derivative of u to the power n, because remember, it all, it's all over x. How do you think we do that? So it's n u to the power n minus 1 times... We took, a, we took the derivative of the outside. Now we're taking the derivative of the inside. Or the x. And a lot of times you'll get used to not writing the dx in the bottom because it's, it's implied that it's dx. So you would write n u n minus 1 du. Because it's implied that u is a function of x. Let's look at these. There we have four examples for these guys. Example six. A. Find the derivative of 5x cubed minus x to the fourth, all to the seventh. So what's the first thing we do? Take derivative of the outside. So that seven comes down, leave the inside alone, which makes it a six. Now times the derivative of the inside, which makes it what? Very good. So the only thing we could do is we could, if you wanted to, we could distribute that to that there. Seven times 15 is 105 X squared minus 28x cubed. And there's our answer. I mean, but either one of these would work. It's not a problem. Find this one. Now I hate when I do that. Something. So take the derivative of the outside first, leave the inside alone, then take the derivative of the inside. You get 15x squared, 4x cubed. So combine the first and last terms, and just we can distribute it. Now, B says the derivative of 1 over 3x minus 2. We can rewrite this equation as an exponent. First step, take the derivative of the outside. Bring it down. And subtract 1, which makes it negative 2 times the derivative of the inside, which is 3. 
So these two are combined, so at negative three, three X minus two to the power negative two, which makes it negative three over three X minus two to the power two. There's your derivative. C sine sine to the fifth power sine to the fifth power of x. So what would the derivative be? What's the first thing you would do? Yeah, take the derivative. The five comes down, makes it sine to the fourth x times the derivative of the inside, which is derivative is sine x. The derivative of sine x is cosine x. So my answer would be five sine to the fourth x times cosine x. Then let's look at e to the power square root of 3x plus 1. Remember the rule for derivative of e to the x, or eu. The derivative of e to the u is eu du. So in our case, what is u? So we have to find the derivative of that. So if u is equal to the square root of 3x plus 1, what is du? We can rewrite this one as 3x plus 1 to the power 1 half. So now we got to do the chain rule again. So du would be bring the power down one half minus one, you get negative one half times the derivative of the inside, which is three, which would give us. 3 over 2 radical 3x plus 1. That's du. Again, the hardest part of this, this course is remembering your rules of algebra and trig. And that's why you have, if you don't know those, you have to review those. That I can't help with. So the derivative of this one would be eu, would be just this e to the square root of 3x plus 1 times du, which is 3 over 2 radical 3x plus 1. There's your answer. You can put it in front if you want.
So again, it's remembering that if you have a radical, you can rewrite that as an exponent. Whatever the root is always goes on the bottom. Whatever the exponent is goes on top. Example seven. Any questions? All right, in example four, we saw that the absolute value function y equals absolute value of x is not differentiable at but differentiable everywhere else. What's the question asking us? Then find dy dx. First off, you have to define what is what is the absolute value of x? What's the formula for the absolute value of x? Remember, absolute value of x takes any number and makes it positive. Because if it was negative, it would be negative. How do you get rid of a negative? What operation always gets rid of negatives? Yeah, but that, that's a little extra work. What if you square the number? Wouldn't that get rid of it? That's what we did in the the difference quotient. I mean, uh, the difference quotient, but the equation of a circle, um, the equation of a line, the slope. So we know if we take this, if we square it, we get rid of the negative, but we inflate the number. How do we get the number back down? The opposite is square root. So that is pretty much the definition of an absolute value. If you square the number, you get rid of the negative, but you inflate it, you, you double the size of it. You square root it, you bring it back down. But you have to treat both of these operations separately. Because if you looked at this, you say, oh, that equals X. No, because the square root and square cancel. No, you have to treat them separately. So the, what this is telling us is the derivative of the square root of x squared dx. How would we do that? Well, we know that we can rewrite this as x squared to the power 1 half. So what is our u in this example? x squared. So du would be 2x. So the derivative of u to the power one half is one half u and subtract one, which will make it negative one half times du. So we have one over two u to the power one half times du is 2x. Mm -hmm. 
u was x squared. The twos cancel. We have x. What does x squared to the power one half equal? That's how we define the absolute value of x. So there's the derivative of the absolute value of x. And remember, x cannot equal zero because it's on the bottom. Everywhere else you put in there, it's going to give us a positive or negative of that number. If x is positive, it'll give us a positive. If x is negative, it'll give us a negative. Yeah, it's... It's pretty complex how this how this works. Because how many changes did we do here? We went from absolute value to that. And then we went back. And that's what you have to know your algebra rules. Remember the first, when I first saw this first time about 30, 40 years ago, I thought it's this, they cancel. So it's just X. The derivative of X is one. Well, in essence, it, it is. It's half of it. If you think about it, since this is the derivative, any X value you put in here, if X is positive, if X is positive, then it's positive one. If X is negative, then it's negative one. And that's why I missed, I only got half the answer here. Example eight. Show that the slope of every line tangent to the curve Show the slope of every line tangent to y equals 1 over 1 minus 2x to the cubed is positive. This is an interesting question. Show that every tangent line is a positive slope. So how are you going to do it? Well, take a derivative. Good guess. So it's this one. <laughs> So we had 1 over 1 minus 2x to the third. So yeah, we have to find the first derivative because this will give us the line, the slope of the line tangent to the curve at any point. So how do we convert this one first? We haven't talked about any ratios, any quotient rules, not for the chain rule. Yes, you could use the chain the quotient rule. Well, let's do it. Let's do it both ways. We got F and G. F prime. G prime. So F is 1. G is 1 minus 2x cubed. 
The derivative of f is zero. The derivative of g Bring the power down. One minus two x squared times the derivative of the inside now, which is negative two, which gives us negative six, one minus two x squared. So according to our quotient rule, we have negative a one minus two x cubed times zero is zero minus one times negative six one minus two x squared all over one minus two x. cubed, but since it's on the bottom, we have to square it. So the negatives cancel. We have 6, 1 minus 2x squared. 1 minus 2x to the power 6, because power to a power you multiply. Since these are the same, I can cancel two of them. So I subtract 2. So my answer is 6, 1 minus 2x to the fourth. That's my derivative. That's using the quotient rule. Let's do that again using what we just learned. The first thing we do is convert, change the exponent to a negative exponent because we brought it to the top. Take the derivative of the outermost. So it's negative 3, 1 minus 2x, subtract 1, you get negative 4. Times the derivative of the inside, which is negative 2. Negative 3 times negative 2 is positive 6. And since this has a negative exponent, it goes on the bottom. So did it save you any time? Huh, considerable. Again, you have to remember the rules of exponents. A negative exponent simply means you change the location of it. Or if I have it on the bottom, I can bring it on top and change it to a negative. So, and you did, actually you called that earlier. You didn't catch it this time. Yeah, I, I was, yeah. <laughs> I, I started, I started doing that and then went back to the background. I wanted to ask you actually just yeah. confusing myself the fish for the quotient. Yes. That negative or positive, how do I times that word? With this, the minus sign? Yes. Well, because when you divide, you make things smaller. That's what subtraction is all about. So in so, yours, 
you have this times this minus those two. Oh, so what is it? The quotient rule is it's the product Yeah. And the only difference is in the quotient rule, you have to square the denominator. Yeah, so it's... I want to make sure it's really like it's fundamental formula. Yeah, and, and it always works because a lot of other teachers will teach you the G, F prime, minus, there's just a lot of stuff to memorize. This is a lot easier. You know, F, G, and primes. It's just a fish. Okay, back to the question. The question says, show that the slope of every line tangent to the curve, this curve, is positive. So they're both the same answers. The slope is positive. How do we know the slope's positive everywhere? Can the top ever be negative? No, it's six, it's constant. Can the bottom ever be negative? Right, because the you raise it to an even power, even degree. It can never be negative. So this answer can never be negative because it's always even. So that's why every point will give us a, which means that the graph is increasing. Example nine. Oh, this, this one deals about, example nine says, the formulas for derivatives of both sine and cosine were obtained using the assumption that X is measured in radians and not degrees. So if you're given, okay. With trig functions, X is measured in radians and not degrees. That's That was our initial assumption. So the question is, what if I gave, if I gave you a sign in degrees, what would you do? So if given in degrees, then we need to change it to radians. How do we do that? So if I had x degrees, what is that in radians? So we take whatever our x is times pi over 180. Because what happens here is the degrees will cancel and now we're in radians. So if I gave you this, any x could be any 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 radian or degree. What would be my derivative? What would you have to do first?
convert to radians. So we would have to take our equation and make it sine pi over 180x. Now take the derivative of it. So what would be the derivative of this? We're using the chain rule. What's the outer function? Sine, what's the derivative of sine? Cosine, so it's cosine of pi x over 180 times what's the derivative of the insight? What's the derivative of pi x over 180? You're making it more difficult than it is. No, this is a constant. It's a constant multiple. What's the derivative of x? One. So it's just pi over 180. So the derivative is pi over 180 times cosine pi x over 180. Remember, you're only taking a derivative of x. Pi is not a variable, it's a constant. All right, that does it for that section. Now comes a fun one. Any questions?